glad to take and connect with you. I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, man, we just thank you for this opportunity to give. God, we see what you're doing, which is the little bit that we give to you and the way that you're multiplying it to build your kingdom. God, we honor you with these gifts. And we thank you that you open up the windows of heaven in our lives. That's in your name we pray. Amen. Guys, I just want to make a couple of announcements, kind of some stuff that, if I'm being honest, I wanted to hog. I didn't let Michael make them because I wanted to hog them. I wanted to be selfish for just a minute if I could. But we're moving in October the 14th. That's going to be a October the 14th is going to be that first Sunday. All right, so we're going to have a lot of things happening between now and then. We've got 5,000 door hangers coming this Friday. We've got 5,000 invite cards. We have over 13,000 mailers going out. We're going to spread the word really for the first time that we're here, proclaim what God is doing, and we're going to believe that we kick off with a huge opening day. Okay. But that sounds good. All right? When a pastor says something like that, it's, it's always going to be followed by a challenge, all right? Here's, here's what we're going to do. And we haven't yet done this as a church, and I believe that this is going to be what takes us to the next level. And I mean this with all of my heart. Every ounce of me. This is just one of those rare moments when I'll say, hey, I feel like God spoke something to me. I felt like God told us we were going to be in a building at the end of the first year, and everyone told me I was crazy. Even those that mentored me and loved me and believed in me, they said, I... Temper those expectations, but temper, temper. But, but that's what he said, and he's fulfilling that promise, and he's a way maker. He is that. But we're going to start a 21-day fast next Sunday. Okay, that'll be 21 days coming up to our first Sunday in the new building. All right, so some of you are like, I don't know what a fast is, and that's perfectly okay. All right? I mean, I remember the first time I opened Psalms, and I was like, the Psalms? I don't know what that is. Okay, it's okay if you don't know what a fast is. What a fast is is we're going to give up something, all right, for 21 days. I'm not telling you that you have to go on a water-only 21-day fast, okay? We're going we're gonna to start a, a little bit lower than that. But everyone has a week to be praying about something that they're going to give up for 21 days. So that could be Facebook. It could be Cokes. It could be coffee. It could be food. If you want a water-only fast, right alongside, come on. Sign up, get with it, let's do it. But just give up something. Find something that you're going to give up. And here's the, here's the important part of it. Here's what we sometimes miss whenever we fast. I sometimes miss this. When you would be doing what you're giving up, the purpose is to spend that time in solitude with God. That's what we're talking about. Okay, the purpose isn't just to say, I'm going to give up this. The purpose is to say, I'm going to give it up, and then I'm going to take all of the time that I would have been doing that. All of the time I would have spent on Facebook, good Lord, how this church would have been on fire for some Jesus. So all the time I spent on Facebook, they gave it to God. Amen? So you have a week to figure out what it is. And I promise you, if you say, I don't have a clue, ask him. Get along with him and ask him. He's going to show you what it is that you can give up. If it doesn't hurt, it's not a fast. All right? Don't give up green smoothies that you drink once a year. So why the next 21 days or not? I'm not going to give you one of those green smoothies. I'm going to lay off spinach. If it doesn't hurt, it's not a fast. So that's important to me, okay? Second thing that I want to say is we're going to have a lot going on, okay? There's going to be a big cleanup that needs to occur. We're going to be moving in. We're going to be turning and burning. That's kind of how we operate. We move fast. We just put it in the left lane and boogie. That's what we do. So there are really three things that, that, that you can sign up to do. Number one is you can sign up to clean. Okay, we're going to have a week. We're going to have an opportunity. I know there's already one circle that said, hey, we will all come and clean, and, and we'll give back, and that's incredible. Number two is we're going to have a, another week. So week one will be cleaning. We're going to get the building October 1. Week one is going to be cleaning. Week two is going to be moving the things that we use from here to there because we have to do that in a seven-day turnaround. we got to have our last service here, and we have to sprint everything up there and get it hooked up and working right and in its place and doing all that. The, the third thing that you can do is sign up to hang to, to hand out door hangers, to go door to door and invite people. And I'm going to tell you, if you sign up for one or two, you're automatically signed up for three. If you sign up for nothing, you're automatically signed up for three. <laughs> <laughs> we want to canvas these neighborhoods, especially the ones that we have bukus of people that live within five minutes of where this new building is going to be. 
We don't want a single one of those individuals to not have a personal invite from us, a mailer, and then see us on social media. We're going to hit everybody three times. So those are the three things. You say, how do I sign up? I was going to pass out paper, and then I thought, that's just a big mess. So here's how you're going to sign up, okay? Uh, everyone get your phone out. It's okay. It's okay. Get your phone out of church. You just still love <laughs> Write this down. Type it in your email address. Save it in your contact. Joe, you can put your phone down. It's your email. <laughs> You're going to send an email to Jill, J-I-L-L, at merge.church. If you can't spell merge church, find your shirt. If you don't have a shirt, let me know. We're going to get you a shirt, okay? Because when we go out, we're, we're, we're canvassing everything. So, again, email Jill, J-I-L-L, at merge.church. Not .com, not .church.com. Merge.church, just like that. Jill at merge.church, and let her know what all you're willing to do, and then we're going to put some, some teams together. We're going to follow up with some communication. You, you have to email Jill, not me, Okay. I'm getting like 50 emails a day about the building. I've got 50 emails in the law firm. I've got 100 phone calls. I'm going to lose it. It's going to get mixed up. You're going to be mad at me. Fortunately, we're talking about forgiveness today. <laughs> so we've been in this series full of you, right? And we've been exploring the hurt triangle and the things that hurt us and the things that affect us and the things that impact us and, and all of those different things. And then we talked about anger and how it shows us where it is that we struggle with Jesus and and then we talked about change and how that starts in our spirit. It's always inside out. That's how we change. And, and we dove into the, the freedom triangle. Jordan, if you could give me that freedom triangle, the last one. And we talked about how that's made up of community, forgiveness, and solitude. And we dove into solitude and what that really means and what happens when we spend some time in solitude. Today we're going to talk about forgiveness. And this is not everyone's favorite subject, right? I got one text this week that said, ooh, that sounds kind of challenging when they saw the on Facebook. And I sent them back. A text and I said, I feel like a whoop dog just, just getting this thing ready to go. I mean, forgiveness is one of those things that we all need, number one, and two, we should get. We've all been hurt by someone, some of us deeper, some of us more seriously, some of us by people that are super close to us, spouse, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, our kids. Some of us by our bosses and our employees. Some people in this room, I can promise you, are being held in bondage by someone that's not even alive on this earth today. You're still holding something against someone that isn't even here. They're not even here. And you're saying, yeah, man, I just, that hurt. I just can't let it go. And so we want to dive into forgiveness because we're going to complete this freedom triangle so that we can be the full us. I remember whenever Kristen and I very first got married, and I was really diligent about being a really great husband because she was really mad at me that I moved her from her parents. <laughs> so I get the vacuum out at, at home, and, and I'm like, I'm going to vacuum. I'm going to wait until she's home so that she sees me do it, of course, right? And, I, and, and I'm, just, I'm just vacuuming away. This vacuum doesn't work. That's okay. And I'm just vacuuming. And, and it's like I'm going this direction, and I'm going this direction, and it's like I can tell that I'm not vacuuming. I'm, I'm, I'm driving her nuts. And I get to this piece that I can't get the vacuum to suck up. So I do what any smart man in the world does. I, I pick it up. And I look at it. And I throw it back down. <laughs> and try again. Y'all ever been guilty of that? And, and I'm, I'm still just trying to to pick it up, and, and, and I, she finally has all of me she can stand, and she just hip checks me out of the way, takes the vacuum, and goes about her business. But that piece of dirt that I can't get picked up, and I've moved around, and I tried a different angle, and I came at it in a different way, I picked it up, because you know, it might be stuck in there, and instead of throwing the trash, I just put it back down, and try again. Some of us, that piece of dirt, that's the hurt in our life that we just refuse to let go. We just keep running the vacuum over it and over it and over it, hoping that the vacuum will pick it up. And it's not going to. We have a different tool that God's given us to get rid of the dirt. He's given us something called forgiveness. And point number one that I want us to all really wrap our head around 
And this isn't the most fun point in the world. It's just the truth is that forgiveness isn't optional for our Christians. It's not your choice. If you truly want to be obedient, if you truly want to be the full you, if you truly want to live in freedom, then forgiveness isn't optional. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 say, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Luke 6 and 37 says, Do not judge and you will not be judged. And do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon, a.k.a. forgive, and you will be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. These are commands. He's not asking you to forgive. He's not saying, hey, if it feels good, if it makes you warm and fuzzy, go ahead and do it. He's saying you have to. You have to. We talked about in a sermon just a couple of weeks ago that the opposite of obedience is optional. That's why this is a command. He's saying you don't get the choice. This is an issue of obedience. You have to forgive, and I, and I struggle with that. I was like, man, why is it that this would happen? Why is it that we would have to forgive? Man, people do unbelievably, incredibly harmful things. I've read a bunch of statistics in prepping this message, trying to understand different positions that people have been in. You know, many studies are now saying that one in four women have been sexually assaulted in some way in their life. One in five men. I know that there are things that have happened in your life that seem like they are absolutely unforgivable, that they're unpardonable sins, that they're things that you just can't let go of. It wasn't that long ago that I got a case that came across my desk. It was a murder case that I got asked to prosecute as a special prosecutor for the state of Oklahoma. And I've tried a bunch of gruesome stuff, horrible things that people have done. And I literally came home from it that day, and it was one of those days when I just, I wasn't right, and I literally asked Kristen, I just said, is it wrong that I don't even know that I want this person in heaven? I don't know that they should get the opportunity. That's how I felt. With what this person had done, it seemed like the most unforgivable, nasty, vile, reprehensible, awful thing that anyone could ever do to anyone else. And then you just start reading scripture. And it becomes so abundantly clear that we don't have the choice if we want to be the full us. We have to forgive everyone regardless of how big the hurt is. And I was wrestling with that. And then I got this epiphany. And it's like, here's the beautiful thing. I don't have to forgive them for them. I have to forgive them for Jesus. I don't have to forgive the person that hurt me for their benefit. I forgive them as a result of my relationship with Jesus, he's saying, hey, do it for me because I forgave you because I want you to be free. Because I want you to experience freedom. You don't have to do it for them. I gave you no option. I made it a command. I made it mandatory in your life. You have to do it, which says you're doing it for me. And I was like, man, I can forgive anyone. I can forgive anyone because he's told them to, because that's what he's asked me to do. I don't have to forgive them for them. I don't have to forgive them because I'm releasing them of the harm that they've done to me. I just have to forgive them because that's what Jesus has commanded me to do. To me, that simplifies it. That makes it a lot easier. A lot easier to let go of the things that seem like you could never let them go because he's just told me that I have to. You ever miss being a kid and someone just, I mean, you know, you hated it when you were a kid. Someone always told you what to do and now you're an adult and you have eight million decisions every day. You're like, man, I just wish somebody would tell me what to do and pay the light bill. <laughs> <laughs> Corey and I were living in Envy yesterday because his brother just graduated from college and got to move back home with mom and dad. And they're missionaries and they're gone to 
Robin and Penny half the year. I mean, it's like he's got the best of both worlds, you know? Man, all you have to do is say, I'm going to forgive because that's what Jesus told me to do. I'm going to forgive because I'm going to follow my Savior. Not because I'm going to release them from what they've done to me. Number two, this is a how for me. How? How do you forgive? How do you let go? You pray for those who hurt you. Matthew 5, 43 and 44 says, You have heard what is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Jesus talked in big red letters, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Man, I'm reading that, I'm like, okay, that's fair, God. I'm going to pray that they get hemorrhoids. <laughs> I'm going to pray they get flat tires every Monday. <laughs> I'm praying for them, God. I'm praying for them. That's how we feel. That's how I feel. There are like two things in my life that you don't tell me to do. Number one is cool off. Two is do not peel the banana to me. I really had to let that one go since I started pastoring at church. Old Jacob would follow you if you peeled the banana to him. We would go Roy D. Mercer. We would just find out how big old boy you were. <laughs> peel the old banana. Now somebody peels the banana at me and I gotta pray for him. <laughs> Come on, Jesus. Are we serious? Fortunately, he always gives us wonderful examples, right? I want to give a little bit of context here. The Romans, during the time of Jesus' crucifixion, worshipped revenge. They loved everything about it. They loved everything about getting back at someone and the Jews. So the two predominant people that Jesus is dealing with are the Romans and the Jews. And the Jews were Old Testament. They're old school. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. He's living in a world, literally, when he's physically walking this earth, he's living in a world that says, you don't have to forgive anyone. You get to get even with them, with every one of them. And sometimes you get to get ahead. And in Luke chapter 23, verses 32 and 34, common words of Jesus as he's hanging on the cross between two criminals. He says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Sometimes we read that and, and it seems easy. It seems, well, that's just Jesus, right? What's he doing? He's praying to the Heavenly Father for all of those that are crucifying him. You know, we see it in the movie, and he's up on this cross and he's up high, and you know, he still looks like the Jesus that, you know, we all think Jesus is white in Arkansas. He still looks like that Jesus. <laughs> got some sandals on, you know, crown of thorns. He's got a little bit of blood. But like he's, he's, looking, he's looking fit. You know, he's looking good up there. The truth of the crucifixion is that before he even gets to the cross, Jesus is beating, beaten to a point that he's not recognizing. And then he's nailed to this cross, and we think he's up high, and he's up on this hill, and he's out of the way. That, that's not how it would have occurred at all. Jesus would have been about this high. Low enough to the ground that people could have looked him in the eyes and mocked him and spit in his face and tormented him. They could have stood and stared at him. He wasn't in some faraway place where the crowd was thousands of feet away just looking at him where it was just a mumble that he couldn't really hear. No, no, he could see everyone that was talking about him. He could sense them. They could walk up to him close enough to touch him, to slap him, to mock him straight to his own face. And then we think, man, how horrible is it that he got nailed to that cross? But what we don't realize is that he actually would have suffered there for hours. He would have stayed on this cross for hours and likely died of suffocation. So he's hung with nails and nails in his feet. And he has for hours a choice to make. Slump down and suffocate or pull up on the nails that are in my hands and feet and catch my breath hours while they continue to come by while they continue to look at him while they continue to mock him the 
The same guys that put the nails in his hands and feet, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The same guys that spit in his face, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The same folks that would have said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, revenge is where we live, it's what we desire, it's what we want, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He's praying for them. And you notice he says, forgive them, Father. It's this moment where he's perfectly man, and he's perfectly God. The human of Jesus has no actual father. The God Jesus has a heavenly father to pray to, to talk to. And I was studying that, I thought, it's the ultimate vote of confidence in our Savior when we pray for our enemies. It's Jesus saying, I am here to fulfill my purpose, and I know what it is, and I trust my Heavenly Father above all else. I trust Him beyond all of the abuse that I'm taking. I trust Him beyond the suffering that I'm enduring. I trust Him beyond the fact that my spouse cheated on me. I trust Him beyond the fact that my kids won't listen and are doing the wrong thing. I trust him beyond the fact that my boss won't quit making sexual advances at me. I trust him more than anything. My confidence is found in the heavenly Father. One of the great myths of forgiveness is that I'll forgive when I feel like it's time. That's why we have to pray for our enemies and pray for those that we know that we need to forgive because it takes action before attitude, you're never going to get to the point where you feel good about forgiving someone that has wronged you. But if you'll take the action, the attitude will follow. You ever sign up like to volunteer to hang 5,000 door hangers? <laughs> Every one of you did. <laughs> and you're sitting in your chair and you're like, it's hot. My walking shoes are wore out. Every time I volunteer to do something that requires that sacrifice of your time and your effort and your energy, man, you think, why am I doing this? And then you do it. You take the action. And your attitude always changes whenever you're serving others. Anytime you serve other people, your attitude changes after you take the action. You realize the blessing that comes from it, the joy that comes from it. Man, I don't feel like chasing rug rats at church today. And then you do it, and you can't help but feel a part of you that's like, yes, this is good. I helped somebody today. I did something. It takes action before attitude. Why? Why do we forgive? I mean, we forgive because that's what leads to our freedom. We're placing all of our confidence in our Heavenly Father in the moment that we forgive someone even when it seems unforgivable. And in return, he gives us freedom. You know, medical science has literally shown that unforgiveness and harboring res resentment have bad consequences on your physical body. You literally physically suffer whenever you refuse to forgive people and harbor resentment. So not only is it affecting you spiritually, it's affecting you physically. It's kind of like this. It's like the vacuum that keeps running over dirt. Put it another way. It's like a ruminating animal. So cows eat. They chew everything up. And they swallow it down. And then they barf it back up. And chew on it some more. And then swallow it back down. Whenever we're harboring resentment, that's what we're doing in our own lives. We're reliving something that's over. That's dead. That's done. And we just keep Barfing it back up so that we can chew on it some more, so that I can hate them a little deeper, so that I can be mad at them a little longer, so that I can be even more disgusted than I was before. No one wants to eat grass once, much less twice. <laughs> We've got to let go and understand that forgiveness frees us. Nelson Mandela in prison. <clears throat> for things that 
he didn't do wrongfully in prison. This is a beautiful quote in his autobiography. He says, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. That's the truth of forgiveness in our own lives. We have a choice. We can walk out the door and leave the hatred and bitterness behind and be free from the imprisonment that is bitterness and hatred, or we can hang on to it and still be in prison and never walk fully us, never walk in the full you, never truly living free. It's more myths of forgiveness. I need them to apologize and admit what they did before I forget. Did any of you in this room apologize to Jesus before he forgave you? I did. You're like, yeah, but I wasn't alive yet. Or I would have. The truth is, he gave forgiveness before we ever asked for it. We sinned before we ever asked him for forgiveness. Before we ever came to the foot of the cross and said, hey, man, I need your forgiveness fully. I need to know you. I need you to erase the sins in my life. He had already given to us forgiveness. Then number three is just forgive and forget. Let's just move on past that, okay? Because your mind is way too strong for you to actually forget what happened to you. That's a myth that holds so many of us back because we say, I'm not ready to forget, so I can't forgive. The truth is you forgive and then you remember with forgiveness. You forgive and then whenever you think back on what happened to you, now you get to remember it from a place of freedom Remembering that you've forgiven that person, that you have forgiven that hurt, that you've let it go. You're never going to forget what happened to you. So if you're waiting for that moment to forgive someone, it isn't going to happen. We have to understand that we forgive, then we get to remember with forgiveness. What happens is if we don't truly understand the examples of forgiveness that we have in Jesus, we fall captive. To the lies of what the world tells us about forgiveness. That it has to come after someone apologizes. That it only comes if you're willing to forget. That it only comes if they've been remorseful. If they're worthy of the forgiveness. And that's just not the reality. Another why. Why we forgive. Failure to forgive doesn't just affect the person that hurt you. And it doesn't just affect you. It affects all of those that are around you. Hebrews 12 and 15 says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Yeah. Hebrews is talking about this bitter root. If you read it in contrast to some scripture in Deuteronomy, what you begin to understand and what you begin to realize is that it's not actually the root that's bitter. It's the fruit that the root produces that's bitter. And bitter doesn't mean bitter tasting in this context. It literally means poison. So what happens is our unforgiveness becomes a root in our life that causes us to produce poison fruit. Whenever we refuse to forgive someone, we refuse to let it go, our lives begin to produce poison fruit, even though we don't intend for that to be the case. So all of those around us eat the fruit of our lives. It's not just the person that hurt us that eats the fruit of our lives. It's not just us individually that eat the own fruit that we produce. Everyone in your life will eat the fruit that you produce. And so if you have a root in you of unforgiveness, it's going to produce some poison fruit in your life that you're going to give to people that you didn't intend to give it to, that don't deserve it, that shouldn't have it. You don't mean for them to have it. Some of you are like, man, how do I know if I'm kind of sort of there? I will tell you, if you get your feelings hurt at things that someone didn't do anything to hurt your feelings, you know, you get them hurt just too easily by people that didn't. I'm going to bet, just if we're being real honest, there's a root in you of some unforgiveness of what someone else did to you in your past on that hurt triangle. And someone made you angry and made you cause something that they didn't do, that they didn't intend for you to do they didn't actually cause, yet they're going to eat some of the poison fruit from your life because you've never forgiven the original hurt. You're now offended by things that shouldn't offend you. You're hurt by things that shouldn't hurt you. 
You take offense to things that aren't actually offensive because you have a root in your life. This is my last point. I love this one. Because it's true, true, true. Why? I would love to stand up here and say, I, I don't hurt people. I don't, I don't offend people. I don't upset people, but it's not true. I don't do it intentionally. There are people in this room that I've hurt. There are people in this room that I've offended. I didn't mean to do it. I'm going to need forgiveness again. So if I refuse to ever give it, how do I expect to again receive it? person in this room has someone that they've offended, someone that they've done something to. You know, we've been kind of tying in some lies of the devil, some tools of the devil. Fear. Distraction. Great tools of the devil. Condemnation is also a tool of the devil. It's a great tool of the devil whenever your life feels like there's condemnation in it. Romans 7 and 20 says, Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Paul's writing and he's saying, Hey, you're not your sin. The things that you feel condemnation for in your life, that's the devil talking to you. That's the enemy using against you because there's some people in this room, I can promise you that the person you need to forgive above anyone else is yourself. There's some things that you've done that you haven't yet forgiven yourself for. And the devil's constantly bringing condemnation in your life. He's constantly speaking condemnation to you. And you can't let it go because you won't forgive yourself. You're eating your own poison fruit. There's a bitter root inside of you that's saying, I can't forgive myself. You don't know how bad I've messed up, Jacob. You don't know my failures. You don't know my shortfalls. You don't know the mistakes that I've made. If you can't forgive yourself, no one else can release you from that. You have to be willing to forgive yourself. Condemnation is a great tool of the devil. You aren't your sin. You aren't your failure. You aren't your past mistakes. You aren't the things that feel like they're binding you and holding you back. You've been set free. If Jesus Christ says you're free of the condemnation, why do we bring it against ourselves? Man, I'm my own worst critic. I'm my own worst enemy. There are times when it's like I bring, I, I, the enemy doesn't even have to do it. I bring condemnation on myself. Man, you just keep messing up. You just don't lead well enough. That sermon wasn't preached great enough. The order of service was all messed up. The volume wasn't right. Man, you're doing just a bad job at home. You gotta, you're not getting home early enough. You're not loving your kids enough. You're not caring for them enough. All of that is just condemnation brought on by the devil. Every bit of it is just the devil using condemnation as a tool in your life to say you can't forgive yourself. You'll never measure up. You'll never add up. It will never make sense to you. I'll tell you, when I was worshiping today, I could see something in the room. There are some people in here that you don't feel worthy to worship. You don't feel worthy to just lift a hand to heaven and say, God, you're good enough. Man, I just want to praise you, Jesus, here and now in this place. Yeah. Every time you come into this house, I, I'm telling you, it's just every time you come in here and you're just about, you're just about to cross the line. You're just about to get to a place of true worship. Your heart's just about to receive what it is that he has for you to receive. You're just about to cross over. He says, somebody's looking at you. But if you raise your hand, I know what you did Tuesday. Boy, you, you flipped somebody off three weeks ago. You're not worthy to be in God's house worshiping him. I know how you messed your marriage up. Don't, don't, don't be in here praising Jesus. Now, you need to sit on the back and you need to be reverent. You need to understand that you've got to get yourself right before you worship. You get yourself right by worshiping. You get yourself right by saying, He covered my 
my sin and my failure. That's why he's worthy of my worship. And man, when the enemy's holding you back and he's bringing condemnation into your life, every time you're about to worship, every time you're about to read his word, every time you're about to give him all that you have to give, not just a little piece of you, I promise you it's coming. You have to say, he forgave me. I forgive myself. I'm the real one. He forgave me. I forgive myself. I'm moving on. gets us in the form of that root. It's that root producing the bitter fruit. We've got the vacuum out. And we're saying, oh, I'm going to vacuum it up. I'm going to vacuum it up. You can't vacuum up a root. It's too deep. It's buried. It's underground. It's beneath the surface of what the vacuum can handle. And we'll avoid, man, we'll I'll jump over here. I'm going to get it from this angle because this is the way. I'm going to move my whole life. I'm going to rotate my life around. I'm going to rotate my life around. I'm just going to keep moving because it's a different angle because the vacuum, this is a good vacuum. It's going it's to pick up the dirt in my life, the unforgiveness that's become a root of The vacuum's going to work. I'm going to keep using this same tool. I just have to move it one more time. I've got to move my life one more time. And if I get my life in the right position, then the vacuum's going to work. And all of a sudden, our life is revolving around the root. It's revolving around the unforgiveness. It's revolving around the lack of freedom that we have because we won't just let go. And the whole time, Jesus is saying, would you just use your head, what I've already given you, what I gave you at birth, the opportunity to inherit my kingdom. You are a son, a daughter of mine. I've equipped you already. Would you just use your hands and dig the root up? You have what you need. Put the vacuum down and quit running it over and hoping that if you just change the angle of your life and the trajectory of your life and say, I'm going to use what God's already given me. I'm going to forgive myself. I'm going to say no to condemnation. I'm going to forgive those that have hurt me. I'm going to walk in his freedom and his victory. I'm going to dig up the root of unforgiveness that's in my life, and I'm going to let him change the direction. I'm going to let him change the angle. I'm going to let him change the direction that I'm moving. I'm going to stop doing it myself because I'm using the wrong tool. And I'm going to start reading this word and just doing what it says. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Man, if there's just anyone in this room that says, I've got some hurt and I don't like to forgive. I don't want to forgive. I don't want to let go. I just want to pray with you. Can you just slip a hand up? Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, man, we first just say thank you. Thank you that you forgave us before we ever asked for it. Thank you that your forgiveness is freely available. Thank you that you forgave us when we didn't deserve it, when we couldn't earn it. God, we say thank you because you've changed the trajectory of our lives. You've given us a hope and an opportunity. God, we thank you that we just have to forgive because you've told us to. God, I ask that every person in this room would just be equipped and able to just forgive, to let go, to live in freedom, to walk free of the hurt and the pain. God, we want to be people that live lives that produce healthy not poisonous fruit. God, let us put down the vacuums. Let us dig up the roots. Let us let it go. Because at the end of the day, we just want to be more like you. We just want to forgive like you've forgiven us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We worship you in this house. It's in order we pray. Give us an amen. Everybody stay on your feet. Everybody say this with me. And if you don't want to, say, I will, I will forgive, forgive because I will, I will be the full of me. I love you guys. Listen, this is an exciting, exciting, exciting time to be a part of all that God is doing in and through each and every one of you. Y'all make this happen every bit as much as I do. 
Every one of you plays a role that's just as important as the one that I play. Your giving, your time, your service, your prayers. We're in this together and we're in it to win it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's have a great week. You might be back with you next week.